My name is uh, John Laurel. I'm a professor in the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method, and I'm going to be chairing uh, the discussion afterwards, which there'll be plenty of time for. But uh, I'm going to uh, first of all just hand over to Adam, as one of the uh, society officers, who will actually introduce the last speaker. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Laurel for stepping in at the last minute. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mariam Namaza to the LSE on behalf of the Atheist Society and Free Speech Society. Uh, Mariam is a prolific writer on secularism, an ardent human rights activist, and is well known in ex-Muslim circles. She was born in Tehran, but left in 1980, which was, of course, a year after the Iranian Revolution. Uh, she then lived in India, then the UK, and then started her university studies in America. Mariam has done a lot of work with refugees, working with Ethiopian refugees in Sudan in the 90s to, to making a video documentary of Iranian refugees in Turkey. When she went back to the US, Mariam was elected executive director of the International Federation of Iranian Refugees, an international outfit with 60 branches in around 20 countries. With regards to religion, Mariam is well known for her opposition to religion-inspired practices such as stoning, execution, sexual apartheid, and women's rights violations and the Islamic regimes. Notably, she is known for challenging political Islam and cultural relativism, the idea that all values are equal. These activities won her Secularist of the Year by the National Secular Society in 2005. After the Danish cartoon controversy in the same year, she, together with people like Ayan Hersey and Salman Rushdie, signed a manifesto to convert political Islam, known as Islamism. Mariam believes in productive criticism of religion. In a recent debate with Tariq Ramadan, she argued Charlie Hebdo was not an Islamic outfit since it equally criticized all religions and the magazine is part of an anti-clerical tradition. She has argued that there is a distinction between condemning everyday Muslims and criticizing Islamists. We're targeting, we're targeting Islamists, not Islamophobic, and in a sense, necessary. She is currently the spokesperson for Fitna, Mo Movement for Women's Liberation, Equal Rights Now, One Law for All, and the Council of Ex-Muslims. She was briefly banned at Warwick University, heckled at Goldsmiths University. <laughs> uh, most recently, Sheffield's Atheist Society came under fire for suggesting they wouldn't invite her for fear of intolerance. But tonight, let's look forward to a reasonable discussion with Mary at the LSE and invite all of you to take part in the questions and answers after, voicing your sympathies and objections in the tradition of free speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you to the LSE Atheist Group for inviting me. Um, I'm going to, okay, it's 6.22. Sorry we started late. We had some computer problems. But I'm going to try and not speak for too long. And of course, after saying that, I'm going to speak for really long. Usually speakers that say that speak too much. Uh, but um, I'll try to go through my notes quicker so we have more time for discussion. Uh, especially since we're 25 minutes late. Um, but I wanted to, I've got lots of pictures for you in case I'm really boring, so you can just stare at the screen, you can stare there. Um, so what I wanted to talk today about was the importance of secularism in challenging Islamism and also, of course, um, the importance of free expression and citizenship rights. Uh, and before I begin, though, I wanted to clarify some terms because I think one of the main problems that we're faced today. Oh, and I'm so, and thank you very much for also moderating me since I'm so, such a security risk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to say that to start with. It but. is a security risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think one of the issues we have in, in this discussion is the fact that there's a conflation between criticism of Islam, which is an idea and should be open to criticism. Criticism of Islamism, which is a religious right-wing movement, like the Buddhist right, like the Hindu right, that should be open to criticism as well, obviously, versus Muslims who are people. And I think oftentimes these three are conflated. So if you criticize Islam or Islamism, it's seen to be an attack on Muslims. And I think it's very much the benefit of Islamists that this conflation takes place, and they do encourage it, as do many of their allies in student unions, who, by the way, had a lovely gender segregated event yeah. just very recently and found it really good that the head of the student union at LSC <laughs> thought it was a wonderful event. Um, so if, we're, if, if I can explain further on this issue, it's that Islamism is a political movement with state power and while it relies on religion uh, as well as of course terror and violence, it's firmly rooted in political equations for the extreme right-wing restructuring of society. 
And I think it, it might be easier to see this link if you look at other religious right-wing movements like the Buddhist right, like the Hindu right, the Christian right, the Jewish right. Um, you've got the Buddhist right in Sri Lanka and Myanmar attacking Muslims. You've got the Hindu right, for example, responsible for a massacre of Muslims in the Gujarat in 2002. Uh, you've got uh, the Jewish right in the settlements, the Christian right bombing abortion clinics and so on and so forth. So I think if we look at it that way, then it becomes easier to, to place Islamism within that context. They're, they're, obviously, they're not all the same. I, you know, I get that criticism all the time. Well, you know, the, the Christian right hasn't beheaded anyone in Syria. Well, you know, obviously there are differences, including amongst Islamist groups. Not every Islamist group beheads people. Nonetheless, fundamentally, they have a lot of similarities, and um, they're, they're, they're placed on the same spectrum of, of, uh, as a political movement. Islam, of course, on the other hand, is um, a religion like all others, and it can and must be open to criticism, even mockery and blasphemy. And, of course, when you can be killed for leaving Islam, which is the case now in 14 countries, the celebration and the normalization of blasphemy and apostasy are hugely important forms of resistance. We're not just being difficult. Um, and, of course, this is increasingly uh, difficult to do, not just, obviously, in countries where Islam has a role in the state or in the law, but also here in Europe, uh, where much-needed criticism is often equated with bigotry and discrimination against the Muslim minority. And of course, you've got accusations of Islamophobia, which in my opinion are is a term used to scaremonger people into silence. Um, and it's really not out of a rather patronizing concern for minorities, uh, as if minorities also don't have the right to criticize and to mock religion if they so choose. There's the Jesus and Mo cartoon. I just fit it in here because this is what annoyed the Goldsmiths Islamic Society, so I thought I'll just add it here in case anyone wants to uh, unplug my PowerPoint. This is the moment to do that. But this is a perfect example of you know Jesus and Mo talking about religion. Jesus says if we want to live together peacefully, we must ensure that everyone's fundamental beliefs are protected from attack and ridicule. The barmaid says, I don't want it to be protected. Feel free to attack or ridicule them anytime you wish, and Muhammad says racist. Oops, sorry. That was uh, God acting out. <laughs> um, now, the thing is, with this homogenization of entire communities, the Muslim community and societies, what it refuses to acknowledge is that there are many within those who are considered the Muslim community or the Islamic, uh, Islamic world, or Islamic societies, who oppose Islamism tooth and nail, uh, who disagree with tenets in Islam, and who dislike uh, Islam even, uh, who even possibly hate Islam and uh, ideas that they find offensive, just like there are those who oppose the Christian right and dislike the tenets of Christianity. So equating, when, when we equate a criticism of Islam with bigotry, it does help the Islamists in their imposition of what are really secular blasphemy laws, using rights language. They're very good at using rights language. And the, the far right in this country is doing that very well as well. Tommy Robinson and Pegida, they're all for human rights now. But watch out for that white genocide, because it's coming. Um, so, you know, they're using this rights language, which makes it sometimes very difficult to, to really see what, what they're doing, because they become so good at it. But effectively, these accusations of Islamophobia are, I think, secular types of secular blasphemy laws in order to limit and censor free expression. And I think we would all agree that free expression without the right to criticize religion is meaningless. It's always been key for human progress, and historically it has been linked with anti-clericalism. And in the age of ISIS, of course, criticism of religion is key. It's fundamental for the defense of rights for equality. It helps to dismantle and subvert the sacred and its political role, and opens up the space for dissent where none is either permissible or acceptable by those who are the gatekeepers of power. 
Now, the problem is when masses of people are homogenized and seen to be one and the same with the Islamists, the right to free expression is reduced to a Western demand rather than a universal one. But no one needs free expression more than those who are challenging or living under the boot of the religious right, where criticism of religion is often seen to be analogous with criticizing the state, and it has serious consequences. So I think for those of us who live in relatively freer societies, the importance of defending free expression is crucial because our criticism can push open the space for dissent, particularly for those who are unable to speak or who are paying uh, for, with their very lives for saying the unsayable. The Council of Ex-Muslims is an excellent example of this. I know we're, we're constantly labeled as inflammatory and provocative. Uh, and when we started this nine years ago, it was to break the taboo that comes with leaving Islam and to challenge apostasy laws. And at that time, there were hardly any ex-Muslims who were willing to speak publicly. I mean, we, we had a really hard time finding 25 names and faces because we wanted to start with 25 names and faces. And most of them are Iranians because Iranians are used to criticizing Islam and Islamism given the history we have with the Islamic State. So it was really hard to find any non-Iranians who were willing to uh, speak out. And obviously today it's completely different. And it just goes to show that it, it does have an impact. It, you know, the landscape is completely different today. People are not hiding. A lot of ex-Muslims have come out and asserting their right to atheism. And of course, this also includes countries where it's a prosecutable offense. And Social media has been really key in that. Now, I don't know if you heard about this campaign that we had. It's, it was called hashtag ExMuslim Because. And we didn't think we would get such a response. But we had 100,000 people tweeting. And they gave their reasons for why they've left Islam. So uh, one said she left Islam because she's a woman. You have someone saying bacon. <laughs> You'd be surprised how much of a reason that is for so many people. <laughs> so I actually was, went to a coffee shop uh, waiting for my son who was at a birthday party. And I heard someone say, Mariam Namazi. And I turned. And I guess they w wanted to be sure that I don't think that they want to kill me. So they were like, look, we're eating bacon. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, great. <laughs> So it's quite a key thing amongst ex-Muslims. And uh, this is uh, Rehman <laughs> She actually started the idea. Uh, she's herself a Bangladeshi. Um, she just recently got her asylum in this country. So we're going to see a lot more of her, which is great. Um, so this is, of course, despite the fact that atheism is a serious challenge to Islamic states. Saudi Arabia, for example, I'm sure you all know, introduced a law in 2014 which defines atheism as terrorism and there are 14 states, as I mentioned, where it is punishable by death. And even in Europe, many Muslims, ex-Muslims remain in the closet, not just because they're afraid, but because they don't want to upset their families, they're worried about ostracization, um, or also, of course, placing themselves in danger. And, ex and, and the thing is, it's interesting because for Christians and, and many others, it's very easy to say you're an atheist. You don't need to worry about it. But if we do it, uh, you know, we're, we're immediately called coconuts, uh, native informants, um, and of course, we're accused of inciting hatred against Muslims. And what I want you to think about is the fact that we're seen as uh, being seen in this way is really seeing us through the eyes of the Islamists, through the eyes of our fascists. This is how they see us. And a lot of people who are progressive on the left, and I say this is someone on the left myself, see us in this way as well. Nonetheless, what, what's very clear is when we talk about the right to religion, there is a corresponding right to be free from religion. And that includes those of us who are labeled Muslims. And the thing is with this point of view that sees us through Islamist eyes, you see that dissent is often seen as a betrayal of the Muslim community, as an attack on the Muslim community, whereas in fact it's very much part of everyday life. As I mentioned before, everything from the veil, from Sharia law, to gender segregation are highly contested and challenged. 
Yet because of this homogenization of Muslims and the fact that Muslims are conflated with Islamists, there's this absurd perception that there's no dissent. It's as if we don't have atheists or secularists or free thinkers or women's rights campaigners. The default Muslim is always the Islamist. And not just any Islamist, this type of Islamist. <laughs> Identity politics and multiculturalism, of course, as, it's a wonderful thing as a lived experience. I'm all for migrants coming in. I'm actually all for open borders, if you've heard my uh, discussion with Sam Harris. Um, but multiculturalism as a segregationist social policy, and it's very similar, we're seeing that in our societies here, we're seeing that worldwide, for example, the Iraqization of the world. You know, Iraq is no longer, they don't have citizens anymore, they're Shias and Sunnis, and Britain is the same, we're Muslim community, Jewish community, Christian community, we don't have citizens anymore. And our justice and our rights are outsourced to Islamic groups and Sharia courts and what have you rather than people having equal rights as citizens in this country. So wh when this happens, when, as a social policy, communities are divided in this way and homogenized, what happens is you hand over entire communities to the Islamists, because those are the people who have power. Um, and rather than siding with people who are dissenters and with political and social movements. So this is why at Goldsmiths, for example, the feminist society and the LGBTQ plus societies issued a statement in solidarity with the wonderful Mohammed Patel and the Islamic society there. And he was, he actually had to resign because they found all these homophobic tweets of his. It's okay if they, they threaten apostates to death, but you know, that's all right because that's in our community. We, we can do whatever we want to us people, but uh, he, he had to resign eventually. And that really, makes me crazy, you know, to think that the feminist society and the LGBTQ plus society will side with them, misogynist homophobes, and not with someone like myself. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the problem with this sort of multiculturalism as a social policy, homogenization of communities. You don't see the dissent anymore. It's those in power you see, and they're the authentic representatives. And there's this wonderful quote from Mariama Hela Lucas, who's a... Um, Found, she founded Women Living Under Muslim Laws, and she's also now the founder of Secularism is a Women's Issue. She is an so Algerian sociologist. And she says, what's most upsetting in all this is the implication that oppressed people can only turn out as fascists, never revolutionary. Is this really what the left in Europe now believes? Can the left accept that citizens are assigned a minority identity against their will on the basis of their name or their geographical origin or that of their families? Can the left accept that this communal identity supersedes civil rights? This is what was done to Jews under Nazism. Will the left accept that this be done to Muslims or those presumed to be Muslims irregardless of their personal religious beliefs? If the left is serious about supporting oppressed minorities, it should realize that those who speak in the name of the community do not necessarily have the legitimacy to do so. By supporting fundamentalists, they simply choose one camp in a political struggle without acknowledging it. I think this is, this is the it. I'm going now because this is so brilliant. You know, I think this is so clear, clearly states the, the issue that we're faced with. And of course, it's not just been student unions and many left groups, it's, it's also the position of the British government, successive British governments, whether it's Labour or the Tories, whereby multiculturalism, I'll have some of that as well, <laughs> whereby multi multiculturalism, not as a lived experience, of course, and multi-faithism has been promoted as social policies to defend religion's role in the public space, impose religious identity as the only marker that defines citizens and hand over countless citizens to be managed and controlled by regressive and parasitical Islamic organizations and imams. We don't have citizens anymore, as I mentioned. Segregated communities with their own faith schools, their own faith-based services, and even faith-based courts. Everything is now separate but equal like the LSC Islamic Society's banquet quite recently. <laughs>
But, you know, you, in my opinion, you cannot be a 21st century human being and live under Islamic rules, whether you're in Europe or elsewhere, and not clash with it. It's impossible. You don't need to draw a cartoon of Muhammad, Islam's prophet, to do this. Just celebrate Valentine's Day. Seriously, just celebrate Valentine's Day and see what happens. From Indonesia to Pakistan to Iran, there are edicts and directives trying to stop people from celebrating it. Of course, without much success. Last year in Saudi Arabia, five men were arrested by the... I mean, they have, they have things like this. Commission for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice. These, these five men were sentenced to 32 years in prison. 32 years in prison. I just want you that to sink in. And 4,500 4, lashes for holding a Valentine's Day party with unrelated women and drinking and dancing. And in Islamic schools here, Valentine's Day is frowned upon and seen as un-Islamic. There are, there are children going to Islamic schools in this country where they're not even allowed to celebrate their birthday. They're not allowed to look at the internet. They're not allowed to go out. They have to wear their hijab everywhere except in their bedrooms. You know, so we're talking about also, this is an issue for, for people living here. Take any aspect of people's lives and there's a clash. Take music. ISIS recently beheaded a 15-year-old boy for listening to Western music on his CD player while he was sitting in his dad's shop. In Iran, there's this heavy metal band called Confess. They face the death penalty for blasphemy because they have been accused of advertising against the Islamic system, forming and running an illegal band and record label in the satanic metal and rock music style, writing anti-religious, atheist, political, and anarchist lyrics. In Mali, the beautiful, wonderful Songhai Blues, they, have, they can't sing anymore because the Islamists have banned music. And the lead singer of this band says, we had no idea that one day we could be forbidden from playing music because music is universal. It's like being forbidden to see the woman you love. Music for us is like a woman we love. In Britain too, of course, you've got the Muslim Council of Britain advising the children of Muslim parents to avoid harmful music. As I said, people's daily lives clash with Islamic rules. If it didn't, they wouldn't need commissions for the promotion of vice and prevention of virtue. No, see, yeah, the other way around. Or, or mor morality police to control every aspect of people's lives. If it was people's religion and culture, they wouldn't need to uh, control it in this way. And uh, here's uh, a photo of a woman being harassed by the, the morality police in Iran. Just last year alone, they arrested or warned three million women for improper veiling. Uh, even though it's compulsory, they're still not happy with the way you're dressed. The terrorism that we've witnessed uh, in Paris, for example, or in London, but mostly in mosques and schools and marketplaces across the world, in many cities, are just the tip of the iceberg. Here's, um, I'd like to give you a warning though before I show you these photos, so you might want to avert your eyes. They were confiscated by the British police because they were seen to be inflammatory. And are you ready for this? Yes, <laughs> they were confiscated from an art show. By, this is a work by the artist Mimsy. It uses the Sylvanian children's family toys. There's a mysis in the background. <laughs> and it's a wonderful statement on the Islamists. They invade, you know, people trying to just get on with their lives. There's more. I'm just warning you. These are trigger warnings. What do they call trigger warnings? <laughs> Watch out. Schools, you know, at parks, at the beach. They, you know, and, and this is the problem. Sharia controls every aspect of people's lives, making clashes inevitable, particularly when you think about the fact that in many societies, like in Iran, a large majority are young people. In Iran, 70% are under the age of 30. And of course, this doesn't even begin to include those who risk their very lives by criticizing Islam directly. We're talking about people listening to music, not wanting to wear their hijab. You know, um, um, going on Valentine's Day celebration. People like the wonderful Raif Badawi, who is in prison now, 
10 years in prison, a thousand lashes for merely raising questions regarding religion and politics. The wonderful hero, Bangladeshi secularist and atheist, Abhijit Roy, he was hacked to death. His wife was attacked as well. She survived. He was hacked to death because of books he's written on atheism and science. You've got Hesameddin Farzizadeh. He's a 23-year-old writer and student who's been sentenced to seven years in prison, 74 lashes, and after that ends the death penalty for apostasy in Iran because he's written a book examining the history and questioning facets of Shia Islam. You've got someone like Abdul Aziz Duada. He's also known as Abdul Inyas. He's an Islamic scholar who's been sentenced to death in Nigeria for blasphemy for a lecture which was deemed blasphemous against Islam's prophet. You've got Ashraf Fayyad. He's a Palestinian poet. He's living in Saudi Arabia. He's been sentenced to death for apostasy because of his poetry, which questioned religion, and he's been accused of spreading atheism. You've got 27 Sudanese Muslims from the Qur'ani sect. They've been charged with apostasy in Sudan. They are facing the death penalty because they believe in the Qur'an as holy, but they question the hadith. So off with their heads. Egyptian poet Fatima Naoud, she's just been given a three-year prison sentence. Why? For for insulting Islamic sanctities. What did she do? She said she was opposed to Islamic halal slaughter because it was a violation of animal rights. Three years prison. The list is endless. It, it does make me laugh to hear far-right groups like Pegida and Britain First and EDL say that they are the only ones who are critical of Islam, crying crocodile tears for the victims of Islamism whilst dehumanizing and vilifying its victims, its survivors, including by equating all refugees, people voting with their very feet to flee dictatorship and Islamism as one and the same as ISIS in order to effectively defend a white Christian Europe against what they call savage migrants and hordes. Those who insist that there's this sort of clash of civilizations taking place between Western and Eastern values don't see, I think, the reality of this dissent. And as Kinan Malik says, he says, look, Sharia is not stitched into people's DNA, neither is secularism. These are ideas that are fought for, that are contested. And in effect, what we see in the world today is not a clash of civilizations, but a clash between secularists including many Muslims, ex-Muslims and others, versus those who are theocrats. What's often forgotten in all this talk of equating Islam and Islamism with Muslims is that Islamism has been built on the mass graves of entire generations. This is uh, the mothers of Khawaran, people whose children have been executed by the Iranian regime and buried in the place called the... Um, it's the place of the damned. It's where the atheists and the apostates and all the, those who should be damned by the Iranian regime buried in mass graves. So many of these people don't even know where their kids are buried, but they go there on a regular basis to commemorate their memories. In Algeria, for example, there are similar stories where you hear of um, massacres taking place by what was there coined as they were called green fascists. I think you have to see this dissent if you're going to be able to separate people from the Islamists and to ally with and show solidarity with progressive social and political movements and to see commonalities in our fight for secularism and against Islamism in Europe or across the globe. What identity politics does is it ignores the fact and it negates the plurality and dissent and it doesn't see this sort of dissent. This is a demonstration in Iran, which the Iranian regime celebrates. It's when they, they expropriated the Iranian revolution and established an Islamic state. And you've got a woman there in a country where the hijab is compulsory. She's taken off her hijab in an Islamic regime of Iran's protest. I, I just want to make that very clear. And she's got a sign saying, no forced hijab. So what happens when we don't see this dissent and we see only homogenized communities? Kinan Malik says it beautifully. He says, the result of all this is that solidarity has increasingly been defined, not in political terms, as collective action in pursuit of certain political ideals, 
but in terms of ethnicity and culture, which is why the feminist society sides with the Islamic society and not with people like myself. This is the story of our lives. I want to take one example of Farah uh, in Afghanistan. This is a protest in Afghanistan. And the sign says the hands of the merchants of religion should be cut from this country. Un until that day, we are going to witness the deaths of many Fashkundas and Rakshanas. They're, they're, Rakshana is a woman stoned to death by the Taliban, and for Fashkunda was, uh, was murdered by a mob, by mob in um, Afghanistan as well. Now, I want to tell you about her story as an example of this descent. She was 27 years old. Uh, a local mullah accused her of burning verses of the Quran. She was attacked, stoned. Her body was run over. Her body was burned. I don't know if you heard about her case. I'm sure you have. Have you heard about her case? How many people have heard about her case? Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'm glad I'm here then. So, anyway, so she... She was attacked and, and murdered, and it was all filmed. It's been filmed. Um, and when, when this news came out, the, you know, when I was talking about it on Twitter, you have these do-good liberals who said, well, what can she accept, expect if she has uh, offended Muslim sensibilities in this way? Because that's what matters, isn't it? Not, not people being killed, but offense, because that's worse than murder, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I can't even. I don't have the words to express myself. But anyway, what came out out of all this was that she was actually a very devout woman herself, and the reason she went to the mullah was to tell him off for selling superstition, superstitious amulets to women in the local area. And because of that, he accused her of this, uh, and and she was killed. So after her murder, what became very obvious to anyone who was looking at this was that not all Afghans think the same, not all Muslims think the same, and not all Muslim men and women think the same. Now, uh, going against Islamic tradition, women carried her coffin. This goes against Islamic tradition. They did this in a country where the Taliban has power, where people are being killed by Islamists day in and day out, having acid thrown in their faces going to school. They were surrounded by men who protected them, and they did it with the permission of her family. And one of the, um, and what's interesting is one of these really well-known mullahs in the area that had justified her murder, of course, as, as they do, when he saw that everybody was defending her, he came to the funeral to pay his respects. They kicked him out. They kicked him out. I, and I think that's beautiful. I'm sorry. And uh, one of the youth activists, Azar Yun, she says, this is what Farah teaches me, that together we can change the narrative that others write about women. We stood up against the most respected mullah, we carried her coffin and we buried her. And a medical student, Niyayesh, says, it was the first time I realized my power and told myself that I am breaking the boundaries of tradition. So I guess the point I want to make is that not everybody thinks the same. Here's another protest in Afghanistan where they are criticizing the attack on Farhonda and Rokshana as well. So everywhere there are people who are fighting the Islamists that are changing the narrative that is imposed by them. Islamism's culture is not the culture of the many who refuse and resist. This is a mass protest in Afghanistan again, where ISIS beheaded nine people, including a nine-year-old girl. And uh, they were Hazaras. And so here you've got the Hazaras coming out uh, in, in mass uh, opposition to this violence. Now, this is a wonderful cartoon. I, uh, oftentimes I'm ex uh, accused of Islamophobia for showing this. But a hijabi cartoonist in Egypt has drawn this, Doha al adl And you should really look at her work. Um, so just before everybody starts tweeting Islamophobia, um, I, I just wanted to give an explanation of what this was because that, that actually did happen to me once at one of my talks. Anyway, as Women Living Under Muslim Law says, Islamism's main target is, in fact, the internal democratic opposition to their project of controlling all aspects of society in the name of religion, including education, the legal system, youth services, where they come to power, they silence people, they physically eliminate dissidents, writers, journalists, poets, musicians, painters, like fascists do. And of course, women are put in their place, which 
as we know, is in a straitjacket. Now, over the past several decades, we've seen the rise of Islamic states and movements. In many countries, the imposition of Sharia law, increased veiling, gender segregation as a direct result of this rise. But I would argue that it's not because people have become more devout or because there's a religious revival, but because of the rise of Islamism. And I also want to remind people that Islamism was brought to center stage during the Cold War when there was a fight with the US, US foreign policy and the Soviet Union at the time, and there was a plan to create a green Islamic belt around the Soviet Union then. And in Iran, too, uh, you have an example where the powers, Western powers, met in Guadeloupe to decide that they prefer an Islamic state to what was happening in Iran, which was a left-leaning revolution. But with this rise of Islamism, of course, there is the rise of atheism as well, women's liberation, secularism in Muslim societies and communities. It's a form of backlash and resistance. She's a Saudi... Um, atheist who's now in Germany. She's, she managed to get out of Saudi Arabia. And of course, social media and the internet have had really great effects, like the printing press had ages ago, in giving masses of people access to new ideas, but also the ability to say things that they couldn't necessarily say in public. Now, I, I just, uh, I don't, I think I've spoken now, is it, how long is that? Half, has it been half an hour? Ten yeah? minutes left. Ten minutes left, okay. I want to just quickly go over some things uh, because I, I just, if you don't mind, I think they're important. I hope you're not getting too tired. I'll try and show some more boobies later on. <laughs> Sorry, that was bad. Um, I just want to show you some examples of, look, the thing is that when, this, um, when people are homogenized and dissent isn't seen, this is what happens. So in, in a place like Iran, you've got this movement against women being denied access to stadiums. Yeah, so it's because of gender segregation. It's because you know we women are too emotional and weak. We can't hear any sort of offensive words that men might shout out in a in a volleyball game or a football game. So we can't look at it. Plus, we can't look at men's thighs because that's very very you know upsetting. <laughs> uh, so that's why they're kept out. And because of that, you have a huge uh, movement in Iran to demand access to stadiums. I don't know if you've seen Jafar Panahi's film Offside. Mm -hmm. where women actually dress as men so they can try to get into stadiums. And he follows women who've gotten arrested and they're, uh, they're trying to watch the film through you know, their little enclosure that they've been locked in. So you've got things like that. And then on the other hand, you've got Universities UK, which is a regulatory body here for universities, issuing guidance saying that gender segregation is okay at universities and that if, if the speaker wants it, it's fine. And of course, they, they withdrew that guidance after we protested. <coughs> and the, the point we made was that unequal, something we learned from you know, opposing racial apartheid in South Africa, separate but equal is not really equal in, in any way, shape or form. Uh, Sharia courts is another example. Here you have groups like the British Humanist Association saying that it's people's right to religion. You have the government making excuses for it. Lots of people, Archbishop of Canterbury, making excuses for it. Uh, but if you look at the fight in many countries under Islamic rules, this is one major area of fight back. You've got a campaign in Algeria called 20 Years is Enough. And they call Sharia law 20 Years of Madness. Uh, and there's this beautiful song that they, they sing where they say it's rules, a code of despair, a code obsessed with women that has to be undone. And in Iran, uh, when Sharia law was imposed, the Iranian Lawyers Association opposed its imposition and they were charged with apostasy, which is an offense punishable by death. So what I want to say is it's contested, whereas here you talk about Sharia courts and we're told it's people's right to religion and you know uh, everybody's really happy with it where it's not the case. Um, the Law Society protest is, a, is a, this is the 20 Years is Enough campaign. Um, the Law Society uh, is another example. They issued guidance. They are now, they, they give guidance to solicitors in this country. They issued guidance to lawyers on how to prepare Sharia compliant wills. 
And it says, illegitimate and adopted children are not Sharia heirs. We don't use illegitimate in this country anymore, do we? They should have just said bastard children, and then it would have been perfect. You know? uh, the male heirs, in most cases, receive double the amount inherited by a female heir. Non-Muslims may not inherit at all, and a divorce, divorce spouse is no longer a Sharia heir. So this is matter of fact. This is the law society. So anyway, it was contested by lots of women's rights groups, and they apologized, which is great, and they withdrew their guidance, and they stopped training lawyers in Sharia's family code. Um, and again, with the veil too, this is another great example of this fight back. This is in Iran. Veiling is compulsory. It is punishable by up to two months in prison, fines, and so on. Here you've got a woman standing unveiled in front of a poster which says, Sisters, you must uh, respect your Islamic hijab. She's taken off her veil. And... Isn't that great? Yeah? Yeah. Um, and, of course, there's these billboards, uh, I'm sure you've, you've heard of, where women who are uncovered are compared with unwrapped sweets. The flies are there for the taking. Uh, and, of course, here, too, you've got... Uh, uh, you know, here you're told that the hijab is, uh, um, you know, a choice and a right, whereas, socially speaking, it's not a right and a choice for a vast majority of people. And it's anti-racist, even, to defend uh, the hijab. So... I went to a protest against the Iraq war where I was told women should wear the veil in solidarity with the women of Iraq. Uh, you know, it's, it seemed to be a progressive tool. And this is Alia Majd al-Mahdi, the Egyptian um, um, free thinker who's, who's done a protest at a pro-hijab event in Sweden. She's applied for, she's in Sweden now, she's applied for asylum. So I guess the thing I wanted to say here is that, again, just to show that highly contested, not everybody agrees, there's a fight. The point of the matter is, what side of the fight are you on? Which side do you take? And I think, unfortunately, what's happening uh, is that many, the, many of those who consider themselves progressive on the left are siding with the Islamists because they don't see the dissent. They are siding with an identity which is usually an ethnic or religious identity that's homogenized, rather than with political and social movements and ideals. So I would say, to close, I, I won't go into the rest of my talk, is the fact that moving uh, beyond this and seeing people as citizens, as human beings, seeing the resistance, showing solidarity with that resistance, and defending secularism is key. You know, we are faced with a brutal religious right movement that is, you know, um, attacking people as we speak. I mean, it's, it's committing genocide. It's committing femicide, I think, in many places. It is, uh, commit, it is um, pushing forward a war against women. You know, to be a woman in many instances is a crime. Uh, on the other hand, you've got secularists always tiptoeing around the issue saying that we're allowed to speak, but please don't be provocative. Please make sure you're not too inflammatory. Always trying to limit how we can challenge and how we must challenge this movement. So I think, you know, if we're going to challenge them, we need to challenge them head on. And that means not being ashamed of secularism, not being uh, embarrassed by it, and to, to realize that, in fact, Secularism is something that many people in the Middle East and North Africa and South Asia want to. They're fighting for it too. But are they getting the solidarity that they so rightly deserve? I would say they're not. And that's something we really need to work on. Thank you. secular values and um, challenging the regressives. Um, that said, I first came into contact with your work um, through the podcast that you did with Sam Harris. Mm -hmm. And at one point of the conversation, you were discussing the migrant crisis, and I found myself having trouble 
sympathizing with and at the risk of mischaracterizing your argument, your advocacy of complete freedom of movement for migrants without background checks. Um, I'm from Germany, a country that has been one of the very ep epicenters of this crisis, having experienced the migration of around one million people in the past year. As a leftist that has grown up in a very multicultural environment in Germany, I'm just wondering, what do you say to German citizens that are worried about Islamists slipping through the cracks of free, of free migration? And do you see no potential for crossover from conservative Muslims to radical Islamists within German society? Uh, can I actually get a few comments and questions? Feel free to make comments as well. You don't have to ask me a question. Uh, um, so that it's, I don't start talking again, so I give a little time for you to make your comments, or, and, and then I'll respond to you. Thank you. Do you think there's a difference between sort of illegal blasphemy and critical dissent? Sorry, can you say that again? Is there a difference between illegal blasphemy and critical dissent? OK. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on, uh, I'm not saying you necessarily asserted it, but when you talked about the Islamism within SQs and then mentioned uh, the um, annual dinner that was held by the Islamic Society, um, I think that's quite risky just because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's making an assumption saying that it, um, as if it is um, Islamist to have that. Okay. Segregation, right. it wasn't a hard segregation, yeah. right. and quite misrepresentative. Okay. I'm an ex Muslim, okay. I've been on that committee in okay. society and mm -hmm. these are events. Yeah. And uh, I just want to uh, clarify that okay. it's not that kind of. Okay. Thanks. Situation. Okay. Yeah, it's just to ask how you could respond to the idea that the gender segregation at the Islamic Society event was in some way consensual. Just okay. To ask you to right, that okay. Sort of Okay, great. Shall I maybe respond to these? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, um, gosh, the Sam Harris thing. I, I, it's going to follow me till the end of my life, I know. <laughs> so uh, if I meet people and they haven't heard it, I, and they, they say they really like the work I do, I say, well, first listen to the Sam Harris podcast if you like him, and then I'll wait for your hate mail afterwards. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing is, um, I think... It, it was a very difficult podcast in the sense that it started, I felt like it started as with me being ambushed and on a very negative tone. If you listen to his uh, interview with uh, Douglas Murray, I felt like I should leave the room because it was such a love fest, you know. So, um, so it, it was very, very much, you know, you've said this, answer this. And I felt that I was explaining myself and he, went, he wanted me to say something that I wasn't going to say. And so it just carried on and on and on, and it was very, very painful. But I, just to give you a background on, on how I felt about that. On the issue of open borders, um, I would suggest um, for you all, if you're interested in this issue, to look at an interview I've done with Keenan Malik on this issue. Uh, I have a TV program that's broadcast in Iran, in English and Persian. It's called Bread and Roses. The leaflet is here. It's also... it's it, it's. Uh, it goes into Iran via illegal satellite dishes. Uh, it's been called immoral and corrupt by the Iranian regime, so it's something you definitely want to follow. <laughs> and uh, in it, I talk extensively with uh, Kinan Malik on this, and I'm sure he explains it a lot better than I do. So that's why if this is an issue that interests you, you should look at that, part, uh, that interview with him. It's fantastic. Now, from my perspective, when I say open borders, I don't mean that people don't have background checks. We have open borders in Europe as well, but we still have passports, we still have checks, uh, you know, and I think this, this is uh, the, this conflation between a call for open borders, saying that, look, people are fleeing in their masses, they're fleeing real reasons. Nobody can look at Syria today and say that people don't have a real reason for, for fleeing. You know, you'll hear about people saying, well, a lot of them are men, but it's not true because it's 50% women and children, 50% men. And even if it is men, that's part of the refugee flight where men come first. They'll say things like, um, well, they're all ISIS or they're all bringing regression. Again, this goes back to this conflation of everyone being one and the same with 
the dictators and the Islamists who are ruling the countries, you know. I think, in fact, refugees are voting with their very feet. They are contesting what is being imposed on them. And the way they can do that is some are fighting, like the brilliant Kurdish fighters, um, but others are fleeing. And, you know, I think for people to say, well, they should just stay there and fight, well, no. That's, that's for each individual family to decide how they want to survive, how they want to save themselves. And, you know, to have this dream for a better life and a different life. Why not? Why not help them? And when we look at the numbers of people who are fleeing, let's say, Syria, 20% have gone into, 20% of the population in Libya are refugees. It's point, I don't know, 0.1% in Europe. So also to look at the fact that so many bordering countries are taking so many more, if they did the same thing, we would have a huge human catastrophe on our hands. And why shouldn't Europe take some part of that as a moral responsibility, as a responsibility to other human citizens. You know, Western governments will intervene in countries, will bomb countries, will do this and that. When it comes to helping people, suddenly there are no resources for it. So my, my, my argument is, look, there is a human catastrophe of untold proportions. People are moving because they have no choice. We need to open the borders and help them. That doesn't mean that you don't process them. That doesn't mean that you don't interview them. Of course you do. That doesn't mean that you don't have your checks and balances. And the fact of the matter is, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying what Kinan Malik said because he's so brilliant. Um, but I would suggest you listen to this interview on Bread and Roses. He says he spoke to a security expert who said that if you profile, because that's the other argument of Samaritans, if you profile Muslims, 99.9% .9 of Muslims are also not Islamists. So you, you, if you do that, you get, I think there was the statistics, one in eight, 80 million chance of finding a jihadi. And my argument is that how does the US government uh, profile the KKK and the Christian right. I don't hear every white Christian male in America complaining about being harassed by the police day in and day out. Well, they do something. They profile a political group. They don't profile Christians or white people. Why then profile Muslims or brown people? You know? And I know Muslims are not a race, but you know, let's be, be honest. We know what profiling means. So that's my uh, position on things. On um, illegal blasphemy versus critical dissent, hmm. Look, I don't think any blasphemy is illegal or should be illegal, you know, and I think I understand that obviously uh, it can be very offensive when people hear criticism of things that are very deeply held beliefs for them. But, you know, I'm offended, to be fair and honest, I'm offended by many surahs in the Quran. I don't tell people not to listen, not to say them, not to recite them. I need my safe space, you know, from the minarets and mosques and... and well, that's life, you know. We live in societies where we all have different points of view. We need to be able to speak. We need to be able to blaspheme, especially when they're killing people for it. We need to do it. I, I see it as a you know, moral duty to blaspheme. So I don't think any blasphemy is illegal. I think, you know, I think what you're alluding to is what even people like the British Humanist Society will say in this country, um, you know, when brains are rotted with too much interfaith uh, coalition building and not enough on defending secularism and citizenship rights. But I think, you know, saying that certain criticisms are off limits, I say no. No criticism is off limit. When they are killing in this way, I, I have only one thing, I have my freedom of expression. I will resist it in any way I can, whether it's nude protest, whether it's burning the hijab, whether it's uh, creating the Council of Ex-Muslims, because that's the only thing I have. And don't take that away from me, you know? And in a sense, I think um, also seeing it as being too inflammatory is really looking at it from their point of view. Because there are, but there are a lot of Muslims who make so much fun of Muhammad, who make fun of Islam, I'm sorry, that's the reality. Who drink, who smoke, who have sex outside of marriage, on and on and on, they do it. In Iran, you, can, you, you have pork, everything, you know? So, what I'm saying is, this is their point of view, and we need to be careful not to take that on board as the... Because it, it does help to restrict, and we need to push back and fight, fight that restriction. On, uh, look, I, I obviously haven't done research on every Islamic society in this country, but I will wager that 
a large majority of them have some Islamist leanings because that's the nature of the beast that we're dealing with today. We're dealing with um, a movement that has, because of multiculturalism, we're, we're not talking about in our societies in the Middle East and North Africa, but here in, in the West, has used multiculturalism, cultural relativism, in order to um, have influence in government, in universities, in the courts, everywhere, you know. And so, I would, and a big part of that is its influence in universities, which is why we see this link between, you know, lovely boys like Mohammed Mwazi joining ISIS, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. If you look at a, a large majority of the Islamic societies, they are inviting speakers who promote an Islamist narrative. They are defending jihad. They are defending the death penalty for apostates. But yes, they'll say but only in an ideal Islamic state. Like, that's going to make us feel any better, you know. So uh, they are promoting it. They're doing it within a rights context and language because they, they don't want to all be arrested tomorrow. So, you, you know, because they're savvy doesn't mean that they're not dangerous or they're not promoting ideas that are Islamist ideas. And also on the issue of gender segregation, well, look, I mean, if you we went to a meeting where black and white people were separated and, and someone told you, well, it was voluntary, and someone told you that, you know, it was, um, everybody consented, it, everybody was happy. In fact, the head of the student union at LSE went there and she thought it was lovely. She really enjoyed herself. She didn't think anything of it, anything of it. Well, I'm sorry, even if I was the only person, I would say there's something wrong there, yeah? And the reality is that when the racist apart uh, apartheid regime in South Africa had power, this was normalized. They said black people had smaller brains, they said, Bantu stones were created for them, you know, separate but equal. Bullshit. We know that's bullshit when it comes to segregation of the races. But when it comes to gender, we, we make excuses for it. And because women are always used as pawns, it, it always happens. And second of all, because of cultural relativism, you know, we, we, those of us from Muslim backgrounds, we don't have equal rights. We are our culture, our religion. It's different. And so gender segregation is okay for us. And that's why when they talk about external speakers, the universities UK, when the Law Society talks about Sharia compliant codes, they're not doing it for Christian, uh, you know, ecclesiastic courts. They're doing it for Sharia because our rights are somehow different. <coughs> and so I would challenge anyone that says this is, you know, they're not Islamists. I would wager that a large majority. I'm not going to say all because I, I haven't done the research. But I, if I if I had the time. Uh, to do the research, I would bet that a vast majority are Islamists, are promoting Islamist norms. Of course, not every Islamist decapitates. Not every Islamist, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, puts a bomb on a, in a discotheque or in a cafe or in a mosque. But every Islamist wants several things, and that's how you know them. They want a khalife, they want Sharia law, they want gender segregation, and they want the most extreme form of veiling. They want to erase and disappear women. So, yes, I, I would say many of them are Islamists. And I think that answers your question as well, yeah. Sorry, I went on too long again. Sorry. Yeah, that, um, thank you for coming. Um, I am sure you're very aware of the kind of poisonous identity politics that exists amongst the student left. Um, I was wondering how you think that, I mean, I'm clearly a white male, um, wondering how you think people of my demographics can actually influence the debate, or do you think it's not the place of British natives to get involved in this discussion, essentially? Identity politics, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want to do the same again? If you... Yeah, please, because okay. then I'm so just the talking non stop. Uh, it's just, uh, it seems to a distinction, well, uh, thanks very much for coming. It seems to a distinction between Islam and Islam, Islam and Islam. But to what extent is Islamism influenced by the fundamentalism of Islam itself? Okay. So say, you know, um, mm. when Muhammad found Medina mm. uh, and supported the Jews, one would suggest that the lack of sort of need for religious pluralism or, or desire for religious pluralism, uh, you could say, I suppose, influenced Islamism. Or when in the Sunnah, Muhammad married Aisha when she mm. was nine. Mm. And, well, no, seven consummated their marriage now, apparently. Wouldn't you say that perhaps Islamism is somewhat derived from okay. that? Yeah. And from that, what extent do you criticize um, Islam rather mm. than necessarily mm. Islamism? Because there are many, obviously, of course, 
peaceful but conservative Muslims. And I think what one point perhaps was your mention of the hijab, and you're saying burning the hijab. But the hijab is a form of modesty, mm -hmm. and many women freely take on the class. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't necessarily be seen as a problem. I said, oh, at least in the UK. Mm -hmm. So, I chose that point. Seems to cross the line between Islam and Islam, mm -hmm. and so to an extent, you're criticizing Muslims, mm -hmm. peaceful Muslims. Mm -hmm. Christian and then Charlie. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming. Just interested in how you might respond to the popular uh, view, not least within the top of the Labour Party at the moment, but the rise of Islam, or the rise of Islamism is mostly not entirely down to Western foreign policy. Mm -hmm. It's the Jews. <laughs> it's not even Western foreign policy. Can I, can I stop here? Because I'm... Well, the, 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 oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. uh, I remember yeah, this. Um, so I was just wondering, so you uh, defend uh, freedom of expression very vigorously, um, and you also have now said um, that you think that a lot of uh, Islamic societies have Islamist leanings uh, in the UK. So I was wondering um, how, where you stand on the prevent agenda, um, yeah. with the argument that um, this would kind of create uh, an element of self-censorship in universities where students are kind of afraid to speak out for fear of being labelled as like, you know, um, extreme and then have to be referred to certain like organisations mm. or institutions and this kind of seems to curb like freedom of expression so I was wondering what you think about that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so okay. I start with yours because I remember that. <laughs> Let's see what that. It's like your brain becomes a sieve when you go over 425. Um, Western foreign, oh no, yeah, yeah sorry, yeah, <laughs> you see, this is what happens. Look, uh, the thing is, I, 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 I'm for um, uh, you know, unequivocal free expression, unless there is incitement to violence. So I don't even think hate speech should be prevented, because the reality is, look, a lot of uh, people promoting their religion are promoting hate speech. You know, you can't stop people from speaking their religion. Um, a lot of religious uh, people will think that what we as apostates say is hateful. You know, that, so, so I think hate speech is very difficult to you know, gauge. And it's, it, you can see that it's difficult because even in various countries, the law, laws are all different. There's no one uniform law because no one knows how to describe it. So I think as long as there's no incitement to violence, we should be able to speak. And that includes Islamic societies. You know, I think... Um, you cannot fight Islamism by censorship. If you think you can, I don't know what to say to you. You know, if you think that you're going to stop EDL and Tommy Robinson by banning him, you're mistaken. Because you're actually going to make them stronger. Because unless you have to ha let them speak, and you have to be confident that you can challenge them, and you can push them back. This is the only way we're going to manage. Uh, you know, challenging bad ideas, promoting good ideas, it's about this fight that needs to take place. And so I, I have a huge problem with the prevent agenda um, from the perspective that, first of all, universities shouldn't be places of censorship. We've already got the student unions to do that anyway. I'm not sure why the government <laughs> is, why they're worried. But also I think it's high, really dangerous to get the state involved in censoring people, it is so dangerous. And it's gonna be used against all of us, you know. So if, if people are happy that, you know, the, the, the really annoying Islamist uh, is being silenced, and, and generally they won't be, it's people like us that will be, because it's always the case. Those who have power, those who have influence, can get around lots of things, and those who don't, can't. So I would say we need to be fighting for free expression you know, things that are being done, uh, like by a group you've started, uh, what's it called, Free Society, Free, free Speech Yes. Society. And I, I think, uh, I don't know, I think uh, as far as I can tell, I think students are becoming more confident in speaking out. And that's one thing that did worry me before is that, and I think it worries a lot of people, is if you have complete free expression, but students are not challenging those who come on campus, the, the fascists or the Islamists, who are also fascists, then it can be very dangerous because you're just giving them a platform to speak and no one's challenging them. So I think the more students do that, the more of a real discussion and debate we're going to have. On the issue of um, identity politics you raised, I mean, again, um, can a white male speak is identity politics because 
your politics is not based on whether you're male or white. You could have left politics, right-wing politics, center politics. You could be pro-women's rights. You could be anti-women's rights. After this whole Sam Harris thing, I found a lot of atheists who are very anti-woman. Uh, and with the Photoshop, and they're very good, at, very bad at Photoshop, but they think they're very good. <laughs> so I, there's, there's a lot of Photoshopping going on, a lot of misogyny. So it doesn't mean just because someone's an atheist, suddenly they are, you know, free thinkers and pro-women's rights. And I think this is the problem with identity politics. What it does is, it says, okay, I want to support minorities, I'll go join the Islamic society. That's what the feminist society's done, or the head of the NUS, uh, the student union, sorry, at LSE. Or uh, they'll say, well, you know, I'm male, so I'm white, so can I really speak about women's rights? Or I'm straight, can I really talk about gay rights? Well, of course you can. You don't have to be black to defend, uh, you know, the um, rights of black people in South Africa. You didn't have to be white, and if you were white, you didn't have to defend racial apartheid, obviously. You know, and I think that's why we need to move away from identity politics. When I talk about the fact that when with identity politics we're not seeing the dissent, that's one part of it. The other part of it is people don't feel comfortable to show solidarity because they think they're not the right identity. Well, screw that. I think you know we've got to put that aside if we're going to move forward. Uh, and doing what Keenan Malik says, showing solidarity with political ideals. You're for women's rights, then it doesn't matter who's defending women's rights, you can side with them. You're for gay rights, well, you don't have to be gay to be for gay rights. I think we all know that. But when it comes to uh, you know, women's rights, brown women's rights, or women who come from Muslim backgrounds, suddenly it's so confusing. I don't know, what am I going to do? Should I defend the hijab? And, uh, okay, so uh, the other questions are on the Islam and political Islam. Look, I think we should criticize Islam unequivocally because there are blasphemy laws, but I still think the main problem is Islamism. Because when Islamism is at power, they decide what you can and cannot say, what you can and cannot think, because it's got political power. So many Muslims cannot live Islam in the way that they want because it's being uh, imposed from above. And that's why I think the main fight is not with Islam, but with Islamism, though criticism of Islam is hugely important. Of course, Islamism takes... Islam has something to do with Islamism. Of course it does. A lot of the tenets, a lot of the rules and regulations come from either the Qur'an, either from the Hadith, which are the sayings and actions of Muhammad, Islam's prophet, or from Islamic jurisprudence. Of course it has a basis, but... That doesn't explain why there are so many Muslims in this world who are not jihadis, who do not want Sharia law, who do not uh, you know, believe in gender segregation, who don't think they can marry nine-year-old girls. With religion, the thing is that people don't look at their texts and say, okay, I'm going to do this today and tomorrow. It's a lived experience. First of all, you're born into a religion. You don't even choose it. I didn't even, I was born a Muslim just because my parents are Muslim. I didn't even read the Quran. I didn't do anything. Um, I didn't do Ramadan. I didn't go to a girl's school. I didn't wear the hijab. But I was a Muslim. I was born a Muslim. I only read the Quran after I became an atheist. And, you know, they do say, read the Quran and it will help you become an atheist a lot quicker. If, if obviously you read it in a language you understand, because most people have to read it in Arabic and they have no idea what they're saying. Um, so, again, it's a lived experience, religion, and that's why you can, um, you can have many Muslims who are anti-jihadis, the vast majority are. On the issue of whether it's being anti-Muslim by criticizing the hijab, well, is criticizing FGM being anti-women who are cut, is criticizing, I don't know, foot binding, uh, being anti-Chinese women. I mean, the thing is, uh, we need to be able to separate uh, a tool used to restrict women's rights, a, a religious tool used to restrict women's rights, and one that's being challenged in many countries, the unveiling movement in Iran uh, and, and many other places, versus attacking people. And I think we should be able to criticize the veil, even if it's people's choice. We need to criticize. So why, are, why do women have to wear the veil? Because they would have flies surrounding them. They would be like uncovered sweets. Because they would be the source of chaos and fitna in society. That's why they need to be covered. 
uh, because uh, you know it, it says a lot about it sexualizes women from a young age from puberty girls have to veil and it makes men out to be predators you know you cannot control yourself I don't know how you're all sitting there uh, with unveiled women in this room it must take a lot of restraint you might be chained into your seats I'm not sure how you're doing it well lots of Muslim men can manage it too you know like my parents and so on so I think we need to separate the fact that we should be able to criticize the hijab. Many Muslims do as well. It's not an attack on women. Yes, it's a choice for some, but I would argue that on a mass scale, it's not a choice for a vast majority of people. And I find it really funny when privileged hijabis here in a free country where they have the right to wear whatever they want, go out and talk about my hijab, my right. When there are women having acid thrown in their faces and uh, you know, um, uh, being imprisoned for improper veiling. I just heard that ISIS has a new instrument. I don't know if you heard this. It, it was in the uh, reports of a woman who had fled uh, to Germany. Thank you very much for that. Uh, she had fled to Germany, and she was saying that her sister went out of the house without gloves. And um, ISIS has a new uh, instrument, which is called a clipper or a pincher. And basically, they grab the part of your body that's uncovered and pull, tear your flesh off. So, you know, when you talk about choice and rights, uh, under these circumstances, it's a little bit of a farce. And again, it's just taking their narrative and it's making it a narrative that supposedly is everyone's and also making it seem that if you criticize it, suddenly you're attacking Muslims and that's not the case. And finally, is everything the West fault? fault? Of course it is. West, the, uh, Israel, all of it. I mean, I'm not sure why you're asking that question. Uh, that's, I'm surprised. I think you need to go back for re-education. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I am opposed to U.S. militarism. I am opposed to the Israeli state's occupation of Palestine. Uh, I, am, I, was, uh, I was actually arrested and beaten by police for opposing the Iraq war. I was charged with 13 years in prison if it actually went through. Um, so I am opposed to those things, I, and I know, uh, you know, I, I don't have the idea, as some people in the atheist community do, we won't mention names, who think torture is fine and who think that U.S. militarism is lovely. But, you know, I, I, I do see um, the problems with that, the huge problems, the, amount, the many killed as a result of these sorts of interventions. And the fact that a lot of... Islamic states are actually very close allies of the US and British government. I mean, Britain wants to uh, bring the prevent strategy in British universities. Why don't they just stop wheeling and dealing with the Saudi regime? That will, that will really help a lot, trust me. You know, it's putting band-aids on things when the real problem is the fact that they really don't have a problem with Islamism. You have British troops setting up Sharia courts in Afghanistan. You have them now trying to talk with the Taliban. In five years' time, if, if the Kurdish forces don't kick ISIS out, they'll be sitting with ISIS at the table. Seriously, that's what they do. This is, this is what they do on and on and again because they don't want the terrorist aspect of Islamism to come into the West, but they're very, very okay with uh, Islamists terrorizing people in the Middle East and North Africa and also with Sharia laws terrorizing the population at large. So I think, yeah, it's critical, but obviously not everything is the fault of the Jews except 99.9% of them. And that's a joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I answered everything. Please. Uh, hi. Um, I think it's pretty clear from, especially given some of the issues you've raised in your talk, that Islamism presents the West uh, as a pretty significant threat. Uh, and one of the proposed solutions to that, Donald Trump looks at as increased surveillance um, mm. in mosques, mm. uh, particularly those with radical imams. Uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are on Okay. Um, I recently got into a debate with a close friend of mine about um, depict, uh, Jesus and Mo um, and depicting Muhammad in general, and I was trying to explain that um, in depicting um, Muhammad, we're trying to um, emphasize the double standard where um, we can't, we can't criticize religion, but religion seems to be able to in some way restrict some of our liberties or criticize some of our practices. And um, she, she made the point that, well, that might be the case, but is necessary depicting Muhammad the best way of questioning those double standards? Um, and I just wanted to know what your view was on that, because I wasn't really sure how to respond in a succinct way to that. 
Yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, I'm from Malaysia, which is also kind of a Muslim majority country, and I just wanted to make a quick comment. I think um, a lot of um, kind of I think the general consensus is, um, especially amongst kind of um, Western people, mm. is that um, Islamists are seen as kind of uneducated, kind mm. of, you know, they come from poor, underprivileged backgrounds, and they kind of had to seek religion as a means of kind of, you know, being able to exist or whatever. Um, but actually, I'd just like to point out that in Malaysia, definitely, to an extent in Indonesia and in Brunei, this kind of rise of political Islam kind of coincided with obviously the Iranian revolution and a lot of them were actually educated university students in this country for example, in the United Kingdom and in the US and when they were exposed to these kind of Islamist organizations from other parts of the world um, they kind of brought it back and imported it back into our country and so now kind of in the 2000s I think Malaysia and Indonesia are actually a lot more conservative and Islamism is actually gaining a foothold when yeah. maybe 30, 40 years yeah. ago it just wasn't the case at all. So, yeah. um, the only thing is I'm mindful of time because yeah. you, you wanted to have a free expression debate with you guys, wasn't that the case? Whereas, oh Adam, didn't you say you wanted to Spend the last forty-five minutes talking about. Oh no, this was the Q and A. So the first part. Oh yeah, part no, of this is kind of an amount. Oh sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't want to take the, over uh, your. No, no, no. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay, sorry. Uh, you have one there. Should I? Uh, I'm so getting lost. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea where anything is now. I can't read my notes. Sorry, go ahead. Um, you made a distinction between Islam and um, like Islamism. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you said that it was Islam that wasn't compatible with modern society. Islam? No. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, because of values like um, banning this, like, or, or like, or banning music and mm -hmm, forcing mm -hmm. like the hijab. But um, don't you think that's uh, like an Islamist idea rather mm -hmm. than? It is, yeah. And, and also, do you, do you feel comfortable using the word Islamist? Because mm. it, it's like, it ties the two, it's impossible to. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, I mean, I think this is a problem uh, that is uh, an issue of debate amongst women's rights campaigners, human rights activists. What term can we use that won't refer to Islam so that we don't offend people? But, look, the Islamists call themselves Islamists very often. And it's, you know, th there are some who use, uh, like, the Muslim right, which is more similar to the Christian right or the Buddhist right. So it's a terminology thing. Fundamentally, I think we're talking about the same thing. I just use Islamist because everybody's using it. It's easy. People understand what you're talking about now, at least, rather than starting to define new terms. So for me, I think, um, I, I, yeah, it's, it's the term I use. Uh, but I know that there's discussion on it. On, on, um, I, I think the problem is Islamism, though, not Islam per se. I think all religions are outdated. You know, but people have a right to believe them. And I think the fact that people believe in Islam is not the problem because uh, uh, 40, 50 years ago, this wasn't a problem. So obviously this, has, this, has something, this is something else. And it's got to do with the political movement, which, by the way, is not because of the wonderful Iranian revolution, which was a left-leaning revolution, but because the revolution was suppressed by the Islamic movement. And we had um, an entire generation slaughtered for them to maintain their rule. And then they exported the Islamic system, and we've seen a rise everywhere. So as you say, it's become more conservative. And I think it's not just in our countries over there, but also here. Uh, I think a lot of people will say that uh, a lot of their neighborhoods are unrecognizable today, you know, with the numbers of people wearing burqas, niqabs, and... Uh, 
the, the whole Islamization of societies, we're seeing that in Europe as well. And I think, again, it's not because of a religious revival, it's not because people are devout, it's not because of Islam per se, but because of Islamism. Um, uh, yes, and on the question of people being poor, I mean, again, you know, the majority of terrorist acts take place in countries outside of, of the West. So I don't think integration is a problem. Do you know what I mean? It's like when they say it's because the terrorist isn't well integrated. As you say, when they've done studies on it, I think Quilliam did a study, didn't they, where they found that a vast majority are very well educated, very well integrated, and so on and so forth. And again, it's looking at it from a very Eurocentric point of view because it doesn't see the fact that, well, you know, there are Islamists killing people just this past week in Ivory Coast and... Burkina Faso, you know, on and on and on. Is is uh, is there media talking about the terrorists not being integrated and poor poor old things? You know, they weren't integrated enough. They were discriminated against. That's why they had to go and mass murder people. So I, I, I'm not sure that's a very good argument. But again, it's this whole identity politics that makes these ridiculous arguments viable and possible. Uh, on the depiction of Muhammad, I mean, I think, um, again, there's a historical, rich historical tradition of depicting Muhammad. In fact, the Iranian regime just did a film on Muhammad. Yeah. Uh, they, a lot of people didn't like it, but they've, they've actually done a film. And there, there are paintings, if you go to the British Museum, wherever, you're going to see paintings of Muhammad. So watch out. You know, there, there are depictions. Again, this is a new, relatively new phenomenon because of the rise of Islamism. We're not allowed to do and say many things that we used to 30, 40 years ago. Um, but for people saying you shouldn't be offended, you shouldn't offend, I mean, I would say, well, you know, it's your prophet, he's not my prophet. So I can make fun of him if I want, I'm sorry. And you can make fun of my deeply held beliefs. I'm a socialist, I'm a communist, make fun as much as you want. And I'll just have to tolerate it, you know? So I think um, when there's, when we're told that there are certain things that are off limits, they're really trying to impose limits to our free expression, and we need to be careful about that. I have a really interesting story because I have a friend of mine who came here as a refugee, and he was at an English class. And uh, the teacher said, well, let's all tell a joke about, uh, you know, a joke that we know. So he's like, you know, Muhammad came one day to the uh, restaurant and then the teacher was like, stop talking. Mm. Uh, you're telling a joke about Muhammad? Mm. And he thought it was completely normal because in Iran we have lots of jokes about Muhammad and about, um, you know, uh, the clergy, a huge amounts. But he, he realized that he can make that joke in Iran, which is a theocracy, but he can't do it here. In Iran. <laughs> very, very interesting. Um, and I think the final, oh, on surveillance of mosques, who asked me that? Yeah. I mean, look, um, Kinan Malik again, uh, I feel like a stalker sometimes because I love him so much and I, I mention him so much. I, I worry sometimes he's going to run away when he sees me. But in this interview I did with him on Bread and Roses, he talks about how uh, in the US they were doing illegal surveillance of mosques and they didn't find anything really. And it's counterproductive because what surveillance of this type, what profiling does, is target a community that then feels uh, this us and them situation, and it's not really getting the jihadis. Uh, get them the way you get the KKK, the Christian right. Don't profile people because, again, we need to recognize that 99.9% .9 of Muslims are also not Islamists. So profiling Muslims or mosques doesn't really solve the problem. Um, on the issue of the gender segregation, well, you know, I'm sure there are women who, when, who want to go to a gender segregated event, particularly if they live in a society where they are privileged enough to do as they choose. The fact of the matter is that in many countries people are fighting gender segregation tooth and nail. Because what gender segregation implies is that one, that if women come into a situation, it's dangerous and that men are too predatory to be able to handle it. So the, the idea behind gender segregation, I think, is offensive if you're a women's rights campaigner. And then to talk about religion's control over women's lives as women's agency is the biggest joke I've ever heard. And again, it goes back to this idea that you know, uh, respect for culture, respect for religion, respect for this homogenized identity, no matter how anti-woman, how inhuman, 
How anti-gay? How anything that it is? Well, I'm sorry, no. Even if everybody in this country and in the whole world told me that gender segregation is not the same as racial segregation, I would say yes it is. Because in, racial, uh, in South Africa, during the, civil, the fight against uh, uh, segregation in the US, there were signs saying men not, uh, black people not allowed. There are signs in Saudi Arabia and Iran saying women not allowed. Yeah? Don't tell me that there is no comparison. There it was based on race. The reason that we find it offensive today is because there was a huge movement against it. People fought against it. I remember when, the, when governments in the West were defending uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa, when scientists were defending segregation, when Bantustans were being promoted as a viable alternative, separate and unequal. They had their separate home, homelands, uh, you know, um, isolated, and we have ours, and we're equal. It's not the case. We know that's not the case because there was a fight back against it. There were fight backs in, uh, in for example, I remember I was, um, I went to a student sit-in. We used to have sit-ins then. Now students are censoring everything, but then people used to actually have sit-ins for progressive ideals and, and movements. Uh, you know, where uh, the university had investments in South Africa and the students sat there until the university backed down and divested. Uh, today you tell me that gender segregation is uh, women's agency. This is what a joke our world has become, in my opinion. And, you know, it, that's, that, there was a fight back. The problem is because the problem is because of cultural relativism, because of multiculturalism as a social policy, where we homogenize groups and we think that Muslim women don't have the same rights as other women, we can sit here and justify gender segregation. And until there is a movement, whether it's a white male or whoever, uh, you know, a black woman, white male, whoever, yellow, brown, green, who says, look. Women and men are equal. I don't care if you think that I'm the source of fitna. I have a right to sit where I want. Look, that doesn't mean that women don't get to sit next to women if they want. Of course they can. But you can't impose it. When you put a curtain and you sell tickets only to brothers and then tickets only to sisters, this is not voluntary. You are imposing Islamist norms in, uh, among students and then you are justifying it as pe women's agency, please. I'm sorry. Th that is... I think the biggest joke I've heard today. And I thank you for that. Thing, that isn't actually what happened. It wasn't male only tickets and female only Yeah, I, I read about it. Yeah, but, but that's false. And okay. the difference is a state of our state of It's very different to a well, student no, right there. Yeah, so if, so if that's there's that's a student group, group if there's a student that group that segregates and black and white people, you're fine with it because it's not state imposed? I'm sorry. That, I, I, I think you better stop there because uh, that's, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, thank you. Well, I mean, I think that is a hugely important issue that we should, I should have mentioned definitely, and I've got to do it next time, because I think that these are things that we need to be supporting as secularists. Uh, uh, you know, I think the reality is that whilst Bangladesh has a really strong Islamist movement that's decapitating free thinkers in, the, in broad daylight, in the streets, They've also got a very strong secular movement and secularists who've been fighting back. And I think this is uh, one way of where you can see the sort of dissent that's taking place. And so there, the Supreme Court is looking into whether they're going to remove Islam as the state religion of the country. So it's something I think that we really need to be supporting Bangladeshi secularists in the first instance. Um, the Bread and Roses TV program, last week I interviewed uh, Tasmin Khalil. He was tortured, imprisoned in Bangladesh. Uh, he's uh, one of the free thinkers there, and he was talking about 
Abhijit Roy last week because it was the one year anniversary where he was, uh, he was murdered. So um, again, how do we intervene? And I'm not, of course, talking about Western governments and bombings and economic sanctions, but people-to-people -people intervention, irrespective of our identities and cultures, you know, defending secularism, defending things that are good for Bangladesh society, and obviously the repercussions will be immense. Uh, and I think it shows the sort of fight back against Islamism. There is a huge fight back. It's just a question of being able to see it and to support it. That's key here. Rather than supporting Islamic societies, gender segregation, the veil, Sharia courts, and what have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. It's almost restoring my faith in students. It's been a very good session. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Differences of view, and but all very civilizedly expressed, and very good, very good discussion, and very interesting, and wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, moderating. Wow, well, I didn't need to do this. <laughs> <laughs>